Well, at this time, children are invited to head down to kids' worship and uh, to learn about the Lord Jesus downstairs. And for the rest of us, we're going to open up our Bibles once again to the Gospel of Mark. Uh, for those of you who may be dropping in for the first time, uh, we've been making our way through this Gospel uh, verse by verse. We find ourselves in chapter 4. Uh, we just began the parables last week, and we're going to finish out chapter 4 this week. But I want to tell you about a resource, um, because we're getting in uh, to this section of the gospel where Jesus is going to begin performing quite a lot of miracles. And there's a great book that was written by uh, a guy named Jared Wilson, uh, who wrote a wonderful book on the miracles of Jesus throughout the gospels. It's a book called The Wonder Working God. I have one copy that I'm going to give away this morning, and uh, whoever gets it first, there it will be on the stage. So uh, after, after the sermon, you can uh, race for it and get that if you want. Let me read the passage for us. Uh, it's a big chunk of scripture that we're doing this morning, so I encourage you to really follow along, keep your Bible open, and, and track with me. Chapter 4, starting in verse 21. And he, Jesus, said to them, Is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket or under a bed and not on a stand? For nothing is hidden except to be made manifest, nor is anything secret except to come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And he said to them, Pay attention to what you hear. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And still more will be added to you. For to the one who has, more will be given. And from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And he said, The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. The earth produces by itself first the blade then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. But when the grain is ripe, at once he puts it in the sickle because the harvest has come. And he said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God or what parable shall we use for it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when sown on the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them without a parable, but privately to his own disciples, he explained everything. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat just as he was, and other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this? that even the wind and the sea obey him. Father, as we look at this passage together, we ask that you would help us to understand, to apply, to obey. We want more of the Lord Jesus, and so we pray that you would help us to receive his teaching this morning as we pray in his name. Amen. Well, back in 2022, I made a resolution for myself, the first time that I've ever done this in my life, that I would begin implementing a daily physical fitness regimen. And so I got into possession uh, a set of dumbbells, and for the first time in my life, I joined that miserable league of souls that works out. 
Uh, why do we do that to ourselves? But uh, I'll tell you, when I first started out, I mean, I was pumping the big weights. We're talking like 10 pounders, all right? I mean, it was, it was impressive. And by the end, wait for it, I had worked my way all the way up to 20 whole pounds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was ready. I was ready for the heavy lifting championship. I was, it was very much there. But all of a sudden, the 20-pounders had to get set aside because I was given this little six-pounder. And uh, this six-pounder demanded a lot more of me than those 20-pounders ever did. It needed to be carried all the time. It cried. It needed its diaper changed. It needed to be fed. Turns out that you have to watch out for those six-pounders. They, uh, they can be a lot heavier to manage than those 20-pounders can. But I tell you, in just four months of having this little six-pounder, all of the things that I gained with the 20-pounders have totally gone out the window. I mean, it's, I'm just back to being old, unimpressive Adam Swift again. Uh, my old friend Flab has settled his way back in all the places that he used to be, and my wife is just back to being thoroughly unimpressed with me. <laughs> but it's, uh, it is an axiom of life. We get out of things what we put into them. You will get out of your diet and exercise what you put into it. You will get out of your career, your education, what you put into it. You will get out of your marriage what you put into it. All the things of life, you get out what you put into it. And this morning, as Jesus uh, gives us his teaching, in the beginning of this passage, he tells us that is exactly the same how it, wor as, how it works in our relationship to him. We must have discipline, he says, because you get out, if we could advance, it's not advancing for me, you get out of your walk with Jesus and his truth what you put into it. If you take a look at uh, verse 21, he begins this passage with a parable, and he compares himself to a lamp that shines in the darkness. In verse 21, it almost sounds like he's teaching children, doesn't it? You can kind of imagine him saying to, to children, uh, what do you do with a lamp? Do, do you put it under a basket? And all the kids would go, no. Or do you put it under a bed? No. What do you do with a lamp? You put it on a nightstand and you turn it on and it lights up the whole room so that everything that was in the darkness is now not hidden any longer but can be seen. His point is straightforward. Jesus is the light of the world. And in him, he has shown through all the darkness, revealed everything that was once hidden. All the secrets and mysteries of God's plan for the world have now been unfolded through his coming, through the Lord Jesus. In him, we can know what God is up to in this world. And Jesus, that's why he says in verse 22, nothing is hidden except to be made manifest, nor is anything secret except to come to light. He is the ultimate revelation of all that God's plans are for this world. Jesus gives us a challenge, though, in verse 24. What do we do with the revelation of Jesus? What do we do with this truth that we have been given in the Lord Christ? He tells us in verse 24, pay attention to what you hear. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you. In other words, Jesus is saying, put this truth to use. Don't just let this truth be something that just exists and is out there, but take it up. Do something with it. Put it into action. And he uses the analogy of measures. I'm sure if I went into your kitchen uh, and I rummaged through the drawers, I would find eventually some measuring cups that you use for cooking. And Jesus is essentially saying, you, you think about all of, the, uh, all of the opportunities, all of the goodness that God has on offer for us in the gospel, the scripture, prayer, spiritual gifts, living on mission for him, fellowship of the church, everything for our good. If he laid it out in one big buffet, Jesus says, if you come to that buffet with a teaspoon, all you're going to get is a teaspoon. But if you come with a big five-gallon bucket, ready to dig in deep, ready to, to get all that it is worth, watch how God will bless. In Jesus, God has given us everything we need to thrive and be on mission. 
The question is, are we putting it to use? Friends, the Bible will not read itself. Prayers will not pray themselves. Our spiritual gifts will not miraculously just put themselves to use without effort. Church fellowship and worship will always be a discipline and require the sacrifice of other things to make time for it. Serving the church and serving the community for the sake of the gospel requires discipline. Paul told us what we should strive for in our growth as Christians when he talked to the Ephesians in chapter 4, verse 13. He said, this is what you should be aiming for. Attain mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Who here this morning has attained to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ? Who can even explain what that is, what that looks like? You could spend a lifetime and be the most amazing Christian that ever walked the, world, the earth, and yet there is still room to grow, still new things to explore of who Jesus is. Our, uh, J.C. Ryle, in commenting on these verses, he says, Do you wish to grow in grace? Do we desire to have stronger faith, brighter hope, and clearer knowledge? Beyond doubt, we do. If we are true Christians, then let us live fully up to our light and improve every opportunity. Let us never forget our Lord's promise in this passage. The more we do for our souls, the more shall we see God does for them. What is the promise that he gives there in verse 24? With the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and still more will be added to you. How will we put God's truth to use and watch how he blesses it? But that may raise a question in some of our minds this morning. The question that may be raised in our minds is, what if I am doing all that I know to do? What if I am in the scripture? What if I am living in obedience? What if I'm not walking in some unrepentant sin, but I really am living on mission for Christ, and yet it seems like there's no payoff? What am I to think when I'm, I'm studying the scripture, I'm seeking him, and yet it doesn't seem like I'm drawing closer to him at all? Or I have been doing my due diligence of living on mission for the Great Commission, evangelizing to friends and neighbors and co-workers and colleagues, all these things, and yet it doesn't seem like anyone is coming to believe. Well, Jesus gives us two parables about how his kingdom works so that we won't be discouraged when the growth that we expect isn't coming in the time that we might expect. And the next two parables that he tells, these are called kingdom parables, talking about the kingdom of God. Now, it's a, it's, we have to remind ourselves, because this is a long time ago now, what is the kingdom of God? We talked about this back in the beginning of our study in Mark, and what we gave as a basic definition is that the kingdom of God is the progressive rule and reign of Jesus. Do you remember all the way back when we first looked in chapter one, when Jesus began his message, how did he begin it? The kingdom of God is at hand, he said. In my coming, God reclaiming his world has begun through my work, through what I am going to do now that I am on the scene. And remember, we looked all the way back at Daniel 7, a prophecy given long ago about, about who Jesus would be and the fact that he would be given a kingdom that would be comprised of every nation, every language, and every people. And from his coming to our day, where we are right now, Jesus has been progressively growing his kingdom, drawing men and women to himself through his redemptive work through the gospel. It began then, it's going to today, and someday in its fullness, it will be finally established when he returns and he will reign unopposed, having put down all of the forces of evil once and for all. But what do we do when we look in our day and it doesn't seem like maybe his reign is progressing? What do we do when we're tempted to think that maybe Jesus actually has competition? That maybe there are stronger forces at work in our world than Jesus himself? 
Well, that's why he gives us these two parables. In the first parable, he teaches us a lesson. Have patience, he says. Have patience. Jesus is establishing his kingdom in his own time. Take a look at verse 26. In verse 26, he tells this parable of a farmer. In verse 26, the kingdom of God, he says, is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. The earth produces by itself first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. What's this farmer do? He does what he's supposed to do. He, he plants the seed when he's awake. At nighttime, he goes to bed. He wakes up in the morning. He does it all over again. And over time, what starts happening? He starts noticing that all the seeds that he had planted have actually begun to sprout and to slowly grow. Now, I asked one of our farmer friends in our congregation this week, I said, let's test this parable. Is this how farming really works? And this is what our farmer friend from the congregation had to say. He said, 70% of a farmer's crop yield is in God's hands. Without water, sunlight, and heat, we can't grow anything. And then he said, we have to plant and have faith that God will bring the growth. What is the point that Jesus is making? When it comes to his kingdom, he alone is the one who can bring about the growth. We are just farmers. All we can do in his kingdom work is plant the seed, water the seed, fertilize the seed, cultivate it, but we are completely dependent on him for the results. We're completely dependent on him for the blessing. That's why we read in our scripture reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 6 and 7, when Paul said, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. Grace Church, this is why we have to be a praying church. Uh, we could work our tail ends off trying to accomplish the Great Commission. We could have the best resources. We could have the best ministry workers. We could have the largest budget. We could have the best methods, the best philosophy of ministry, and it would be for nothing unless God bless the work. What did Jesus teach us to pray in the Lord's Prayer? Your kingdom come. We can't make his kingdom come. Only he can. But let's not confuse being patient with being passive. We really do have to do the work that a farmer does. We plant the seed, we fertilize, we cultivate, but ultimately we wait patiently on the Lord. I was remembering this week, one time I was babysitting one of my nieces, and uh, I was, decided I would drive her to a park to take her to a playground. The drive was only about 15 minutes long. But the entire way, she was going, Uncle Adam, it's taking a long time, she said. It's taking a long time. And I thought, don't we pray like that sometimes? Jesus, it's taking a long time. And what would Jesus say? Be patient. I know what I'm doing. My time. My time. Jesus is sovereign over his kingdom. And he's promised us, take a look at verse 29, when the grain is ripe, at once he puts in the sickle, because the harvest has come. The kingdom will come in its fullness. There will be a harvest. Just wait. A great quote that I read recently from David Calhoun, he said, knowing Christ is sovereign helps us live without answers until we arrive at the place where we'll live without questions. Let me read that again. Knowing Christ is sovereign helps us live without answers until we arrive at the place, heaven, where we'll live without questions. Seem like it's taking a long time. Be patient. Jesus is establishing his kingdom in his own time. The second parable that he gives to us teaches us to have hope. Jesus uses small means for big ends. Have hope, Jesus uses small means for big ends. Take a look at verse 30. 
verse 30, he says, With what can we compare the kingdom of God, and what parable shall we use for it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which, when sown on the ground, is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. This little mustard seed that has the capacity to become this very large thing. If you were holding a mustard seed, here is what it would look like. That tiny little dot on the tip of that person's finger. It really is a very small seed. But here's what a full-grown mustard tree looks like when it's fully grown. You can see that little bench at the bottom there. That's a big tree from such a little seed. Have you ever been tempted to look at the church, our church, church in Lancaster, church in our nation, church around the world? Have you ever been tempted to look at it and say, really? These are the ones who are going to change the world? With these methods? With these personalities? And Jesus teaches us all throughout the New Testament, he intentionally chooses small, insignificant things. I love what Paul said in 1 Corinthians. He said, consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, the mustard seeds of the world. For what reason? So that no human being might boast in the presence of God. That in the end, it would be his power that would be obviously at work. And in the end, he is the one who gets the glory. What did Paul say? We have these treasures in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power doesn't belong to us, but to God. When we are weak is when we are strong. Jesus tells us, my power is made perfect in weakness. So we have hope. Jesus uses small means for big ends. We go on in verse 35 to see um, a, an encounter of a storm. This is a familiar story. I never before this week saw the connection that, uh, that Mark makes between the parables that Jesus teaches here and then the storm that they go through together, him and his disciples. But if you notice on verse 35, when did they go through the storm? Verse 35, on that day, the day that Jesus teaches his disciples these important lessons about having trust and faith in him and believing and being confident that he really is sovereign over his kingdom, that his rule and reign really is all-encompassing, that he's in control, it's on this day that he has them go through this storm. And what we see from this, lastly, is have faith. Jesus is sovereign in real time. Now, what happens in this story? Jesus, after he's done teaching in verse 35, he tells the guys, let's go across to the other side of the sea. And so they get in their boats. There are other boats with them in verse 36, and off they go. What happens? In verse 37, a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat. Some of you may have been on the Susquehanna or maybe the Chesapeake, somewhere else, bigger, more impressive waters than the ones around us. And maybe you, you endured some choppy waters. It was a little scary. It was nothing like what the disciples and Jesus were facing in this storm here in verse 37. You see, the boat was already filling. They really were about to sink. They really were in present danger. And where do we find Jesus? Jesus. In verse 38, he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. Why is Jesus asleep? Well, on a basic level, obviously he's tired. It's been a long day of teaching with a large crowd. But at a more fundamental level, Jesus is asleep in the, st in the stern through the storm because he's the king of the kingdom. He is the one who rules the waves. He is the one who rules the sky. He's the one who rules everything. He is completely confident in his ability to protect his followers through this storm. And so he sleeps. He's totally confident in his ability to rule. Are his disciples 
totally confident in his ability. Take a look again at verse 38. What do they do? They woke him and said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Hey, buddy, we're kind of dying here. Are you going to sleep or are you going to do something? Are you going to help us bail water out? What are you going to do? Have you ever in the storm of a life, of life, prayed to Jesus, do you not care? Well, what does Jesus do in verse 39? It says, he awoke. I just wonder, I wonder if, you know, he kind of took his time waking up. You know, did he do one of these, you know? Really keep him on edge. He awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace, be still. And the wind ceased. Everything got calm that quick. Total tranquility, as if there was no storm. And he asked them two questions, two fundamental questions that we should ask ourselves. Number one question in verse 40, he says, why are you so afraid? Notice he doesn't say, why were you so afraid? He uses present tense. In other words, why are you such a fearful bunch? And then the important question, verse 40, the second one, have you still no faith? After all we've been through, after all you've seen at work, through me, after all of my teaching, have you still no faith in my rule and reign? Well, the, Jesus, uh, the uh, disciples' fear is transferred. In verse 41, they went in fearing the storm. They come out of the storm fearing Jesus. In verse 41, they were filled with great fear and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? When the storms of life come, which fear wins out at the end of the day? Does the storm win out in terms of your fear? Or does your fear of Christ win out over the storm? Jared Wilson in his book, the book that you're going to wrestle for at the end of the service, he tells a story of a man who was stuck in a storm on a boat, and he really thought, he really did think that the boat was going to capsize. It was that bad of a storm. So in his nerves, he made his way up to the, to the thing where the captain stays, the uh, place where the captain does his thing with a wheel. And um, <laughs> he, he made his way up there, and to his shock, in the midst of the storm, what was the captain doing? He was completely at ease. He said he only had one hand on the wheel, and he had a cup of coffee in the other. And he was just navigating the storm. And he made eye contact with this guy, and he said all he did was give him a wave or a nod and a smile. And he said, all of a sudden, all my fears were calmed. I went back down into the the other part of the boat where the people are, (laughs) and, uh, and I said to them, I just saw the pilot, and he looks completely confident. I think we're gonna be okay. And Jared Wilson says, imagine if you went up to that place where the captain is, and he wasn't even at the wheel, but he was so sure that they were going to be okay that he was dead asleep. Jesus can manage the storm in his sleep. Friends, tying it all together, God has given us everything, everything we could possibly need in the coming of Christ. Since he has come, he has shed light on all of the things that once remained in darkness. We have everything we need. Dive in, not with a teaspoon, but with a five-gallon bucket. Get all you can. Put this truth to use. And when you are discouraged that the growth that you thought you might have by now is not quite there, remember the lessons of Jesus. Have patience. He's establishing his kingdom in his own timing. He knows what he's doing. When you look at yourself, you look at the church, it seems so small and unimpressive. Remember to have hope. Jesus uses small means for big ends. And when the storms of life come and you're tempted to absolutely freak out, have faith. Jesus can manage the storm in his sleep. Let's pray. 
Father, we're thankful that we serve a Jesus who is completely in control. When we don't have answers to our questions, uh, we remind ourselves that he slept through the storm. And so, Father, help us not to be discouraged, but to remember that he has his own timing and he knows what he's doing. And uh, we don't need to try to take the kingdom into our own hands and uh, help him out in any way. He tells us to be about uh, the Great Commission. And so help us to do the good work of, of doing that farming work, planting seeds, watering seeds, cultivating your kingdom, uh, but trusting the results at the end of the day, getting out of the way and letting Jesus do what he does best. Uh, keep us mustard seeds. Uh, help us to actually enjoy the fact that we are small and insignificant because Jesus will glorify himself all that much more. And Lord, this morning, there may be some here who feel like they're in that storm of life. They feel completely overwhelmed. Maybe they are praying those prayers. Jesus, do you not care? Help them to remember that Jesus slept through the storm because he was confident. He knew what he was doing. He was able to protect his own. So we look to you. You are the only one worthy. We look forward to that day when you will bring your kingdom in its fullness. And your rule and reign will be completely established. And we'll reign with you with perfect peace for all time. We pray that day would be soon. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.